Welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. I'm joined on the podcast today by Bryn Turnbull, author of the new novel, The Paris Deception. Best-selling writer Kate Quinn wrote about the novel, The Paris Deception Deceives, Intrigues, and Enthralls. Bryn Turnbull's best book yet. <laughs> Bryn, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Jeff. Thank you so much for having me on. It's a Absolutely. pleasure to be chatting with you. Well, if someone hasn't yet heard about your novel, The Paris Deception, how would you describe the novel? So The Paris Deception is about art theft and forgery in Nazi-occupied France. <laughs> and the bulk of the action takes place in this museum uh, that's located within the Jardin de Tuileries called the Jeu du Pomme, which is where the Nazis, um, under the direction of an art commission called the ERR, took all of the art that they looted from Jewish families um, in occupied Europe. Uh, they took it to this gallery. They used it kind of as a shopping mall for high-ranking <laughs> Nazis to come and pick which pieces of art they liked um, to send back into the Reich. And um, yeah, they they really, you know, it was it was kind of one of the central locations from which they conducted their sort of looting of Europe's cultural heritage and the cultural heritage of these families. So oh. my book involves two young women, um, sisters-in-law who start out the novel at very serious odds, who team up to try and um, stop the Nazis from stealing this art from its rightful owners by replacing the masterpiece mm -hmm. paintings with clever forgeries. Uh, I don't want to get too much farther into it than that, sure. but um, you know, it's, uh, yeah, it's it's kind of an audacious little story, um, yeah, that takes place against against the tense and tumultuous time of the Nazi occupation. Sure. Do you remember the original idea or impetus that led you to writing the Paris Deception? <laughs> yes, I do. Um, I actually have my brother to thank uh, for this book. My thank first you. novel, I dedicated to my sister. My second That's novel, I dedicated me. to my grandmother. Okay. And when it came time to write my third book. <laughs> My brother pulled me aside and said, when are you going to write a book for me? Uh, <laughs> so I said, what would you what would you like me to write about? And <laughs> he told me his favorite movie was The Thomas Crown Affair. And he wanted me to write a book that he would enjoy better than The Thomas Crown Affair. So I said, OK, art heist. I can work with art heist. Um, so that was kind of impetus number one. Impetus number two was that I had recently heard about a real yeah. life case which took place in the 1940s of a Dutch forger named Han van Meegeren who sold a fake Vermeer to Hermann Goring. And I thought that that was just such a fascinating thing um, that this, you know, this forger duped a man who considered himself to be quite, uh, you know, quite a connoisseur of art, so to speak. And so that was kind of the second thread. So I'd said, okay, art heist, art forgery. And it kind of came together in the story around the Jeu du Palme. And, um, a woman named Rose Valland, who was a resistance operative who worked within the museum at the time. So those three things kind of threaded together. And uh, my brother will have to be the final arbiter as to whether I bested the Thomas Crown affair for him. But um, I, it was a real pleasure to write. Well, has he read the novel yet? Not yet. He has it, though. He has it. So I'm waiting with bated breath to hear what he thinks. <laughs> sure. Well, well, you mentioned art forgery and art heist and um, Nazi-occupied France. What kind of research did you do as you were uh, planning and writing The Paris Deception? You know, this was a very research-heavy book. Um, <laughs> and I mean, to be honest, that's my favorite kind of book to write. Mm -hmm. I absolutely love going into the research of different time periods, and particularly, you know, this time period, you know, with the Holocaust, it's just, it's, it's such an important and momentous um, part of history that I wanted to make sure that I, I got it right, so to speak. Um, and, and, you know, with the art angle, the, it was very kind of specialized, I would say, uh, in terms of the research that I was doing. So one of the things that I did was I actually met uh, with a number of art conservators mm -hmm. because Sophie, the main character, is an art conservator, um, back then would it be called an art restorer, who works within the Jeu de Pomme Museum and gets kind of co-opted by this Nazi commission mm -hmm. to work for them mm -hmm. uh, quite reluctantly. So I was able to go and meet with a number of art conservators uh, in New York at the Met, at MoMA, and the Museum of Natural History, who very generously showed me around their 
uh, their conservation labs and talked me through kind of the philosophy of art conservation and how art conservation has changed from, um, you know, from the 1940s to now. So that was a big one. Um, I went to France, which was wonderful. Um, went to France to visit the museum where this book takes place and uh, to sit outside it for two days and plan an art heist, how I would how I would break into the museum and break out with a bunch of paintings. So I'm pretty sure that the museum staff took notice of me standing outside <laughs> taking pictures and, you know, looking very suspiciously through their windows. Um, and then the other side, of course, was the art forgery side of things. Um, so I was able to get my hands on a number of art forging manuals, which kind of talked me through how to forge. And I actually was able to meet with a real life art forger who explained to me kind of some of the particulars of how to go about forging masterworks of art. Well, what was your writing journey that led you to writing and getting your first novel published? Oh, gosh. Well, I so I always, always have been a writer. Um, my parents would tell you I was writing from the time I learned how to read. And for me, I always thought that writing, it was always something I wanted to do, but it was never something that I considered was like a viable career option. So I, you know, I went through school, went through university, did English Lit and History. And when I got to the end of that, uh, of that program, my parents said to me, you know, you should consider doing an MFA. You should consider doing a, a, you know, a course in creative writing. And I said, nobody ever actually gets published. It's not a real thing. (laughs) It would take me years. Like, no, I'm going to get a real job. I'm going to get that desk job. I'm going to, I'm going to enjoy it. So I, uh, I did, I got that desk job. I worked in corporate communications and I couldn't stand it. (laughs) It was not for me, you know, (laughs) sitting in a cubicle. It was just not for me. And I ended up actually coming across the character who became the protagonist of my first novel, Thomas Burnett. Um, while I was working at that job, I was at home one night. It was like a Thursday night. And I came across a movie mm-hmm. directed by Madonna, of all people, called W.E. And so Thomas Furness was a mistress of the Prince of Wales. And this movie that I was watching was about, you know, the Prince of Wales and Wallace Simpson and the abdication crisis. But she referenced Thelma Furness. In the, in the movie, and I kind of sat up a little straighter when I when this character came across the screen. I said, well, what's her story? Started looking into it, and by the end of that night, I kind of drafted out what became The Woman Before Wallace, my first novel. Um, so at that point, of course, I, I went back to my parents kind of with my tail between my legs and said, yeah, remember when you told me I should do a degree in creative writing and I should, you know, I should pursue creative writing as a career? Uh, I'm going to do that now. I'm going to give up the <laughs> corporate job and I'm going to move to Scotland and I'm going to write this book. And they said to their eternal credit, what took you so long? Thank goodness you finally got there in the end. Absolutely go write the book. <laughs> so that was kind of how I got into writing, um, into writing my first novel. And I was really, really fortunate. It got picked up fairly quickly. I think, um, you know, at the time when I started writing the book, the du- Duke and Duchess of Sussex had not even met, I don't think. But I think the timing kind of ended up working in my favor because when the book came out, they'd gotten married and, you know, British royal, American bride, um, people were drawing a lot of parallels. And so, yeah, that was that was my journey to getting that first book published. And now I'm I'm three books in. I've got a fourth on the way and I am doing the job that makes me absolutely the happiest I could ever be. So I'm, I'm incredibly lucky. Did you ever get your MFA? I got a master's in creative writing. Yeah. Got it. Uh-huh. <laughs> Where did you go? Uh, University of St. Andrews. So I spent a year in Scotland. Um, and the reason I chose St. Andrews was because Telma, mm-hmm. you know, during this affair with the Prince of Wales, she was in the UK. And so I wanted to be in the UK for a while, uh, kind of immerse myself in the high society culture, which St. Andrews being a, a very um, lovely and prestigious university certainly had had that in spades. But also I wanted to make sure that if it turned out I was terrible at writing and I had to go back to the desk job, I wanted to have something to show for it on my resume. So that was why I decided to get the MFA, just to kind of make sure that I had something something to show for my year if it turned out that the end wasn't going to be a book. I'm curious about your writing process when you were working on the Paris Deception. 
Mm-hmm. Are you someone who does an extensive outline before writing? Do you just kind of dive into the narrative? How does that work for you? Yeah, am I a plotter or a pantser? Um, I would say a little bit of both. I, you know, for this book because it's got kind of a bit of a thriller <laughs> side to it. It's it's very high tension. Um, there are a lot of moving parts in it. I did write a fairly extensive outline for this book, but I think like many writers who start with the best of intentions and very detailed outlines, the outlines quickly derailed. <laughs> and I had to kind of go back to the drawing board time and time again rework and re kind of reforge that path that I was heading on. So yeah, it's the outline though was, was very important. And I mean, this is the first book that I've written. My first two novels were both um, (laughs) historical heroines. So I had a lot to kind of draw from in creating those characters. I had their diaries. I had, you know, news footage of them, um, you know, biographies, all that with this book, this is my first novel where the two protagonists are fully fictional. And so that kind of lent itself to a whole different (laughs) method of creation for me, because I didn't have those kind of support structures to fall Mm. back on in in creating those two characters. So, um, yeah, it was, it was very interesting. I really, I really enjoyed that process of creating these characters from scratch, so to speak. Well, as you explained, you 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 said that you would write and then go back and and kind of revise the the outline. Mm-hmm. How how did that work exactly? I mean, would you write a chapter and then kind of compare it to your outline and then make tweaks and kind of go from there? Yeah, yeah, I would, I would, I I like so when my my outlines are, they are very extensive. Like I'll write kind of a paragraph or two um, for each chapter and then build on those those two mm-hmm. paragraphs to create the full chapter. And yeah, there are certainly elements where I have to go back. Well, I have to move forward and tweak what's going to happen in the future. But then I also occasionally have to go back and tweak what's happened in the past, depending on where that chapter is going. So if that makes any sense. (laughs) Yes. Yes, it does. Well, what writing advice would you offer for those who may be listening and are working on their own stories or novels? I would say it is, if, you, if you're new to writing, uh, an outline can be very, very helpful. A detailed outline can be incredibly helpful because when you get stuck and all writers do get stuck at some point in the process of writing a book, that outline can kind of help be a kickstart to kind of jump back in and can keep you motivated through the course of writing a book that might take years to write. Um, so I would say like have an outline and even if you don't follow it to the letter, it does give you kind of a guide path through the forest and allows you to kind of see glimpses of where you're going to go, even if you end up getting there in a completely different way. Uh, the other thing I would say is make sure that you like your characters because you spend a lot of time with them. You don't you don't leave your characters behind when you stop writing for the day. They're still there in the back of your mind. So make sure that you like them. Make sure that you enjoy spending time with them because they're, they're around a lot. <laughs> sure. Well, you... you- the Paris Deception is your third novel, and you mentioned in passing earlier that you have a fourth novel in the works. Um, can you tell us just a, a hint about that novel? Absolutely. Um, so my fourth novel takes place in Berlin in 1961, and it is about a couple that gets separated by the construction of the Berlin Wall. So That sounds fun. Yeah. Yeah, very different time period, very different... Uh, different research process for sure with this one. Um, sure. But yeah, yeah. I'm really enjoying it and I'm, I'm looking forward to getting Thank to Berlin you. to kind of do a little exploring around that part of the world. What <laughs> novels have, or nonfiction books have you read recently that you enjoyed? Mm. Um, so Madeline Martin actually has a book that is coming out in August called The Keeper of Hidden Books. And it, it, it it's about um, Poland during the Second World War and about librarians in Poland who safeguarded novels um, and literature, Polish literature from the Nazis who came in and kind of, you know, they, they tried to eradicate the Polish culture almost wholesale. And it was through the efforts of these librarians that they were able to safeguard, um, you know, Polish literature and, and Jewish literature in Warsaw and beyond. Um, so I absolutely love that book. Um, I thought it was incredible. Um and you know there there are there are some interesting parallels with mine because they're both about 
censorship and about you know about this Nazi attempt to ban um, to ban art and culture. And yeah, I, I really, really, really loved that book. Um, another one that I read recently and I really enjoyed um, was Carly Fortune's latest book. It's a rom com called Meet Me by the Lake. Uh, and if anyone has has read Carly Fortune's first novel, um, it's just incredible, really, really wonderful. Very different from the uh, from the historical fiction world, which is nice when you are in the middle of you know when you're in kind of the slog of writing history. <laughs> it's nice to be, kind of be able to pull away from it and, and have a bit of a palate cleanser uh, of something that's just so completely different and beautifully written. So yeah, Car- Carly Fortune's just a, she's a wonderful writer. You just mentioned censorship and. Um... Mm-hmm. Uh, kind of the the attack on culture. What are what are your thoughts about sadly the the current wave of book banning or attempts at book banning, specifically in the U.S. recently? Oh, I mean, I think it's just I think it's terrible. I I really do. Um, you know, looking at looking at <laughs> book banning from a historical perspective, book ban. People who ban books, they're never on the right side of history in doing that. Um, I think that so much of it comes from uh, comes from fear, fear of the unknown, fear of, uh, you know, fear of diverse voices. And fear should never be the guiding factor in decision making and in policy making. Um, so I, I, you know, with book banning and, you know, banning the stories of LGBTQIA people, um, specifically, it's. I, I, I don't see that being a good thing ever. Um, yeah. And I, I just, I support to the hilt authors and creators, um, and freedom of expression. Sure. We're in agreement on that. Well, where can people find you online if they want to learn more about you and your novels and your new novel, The Paris Deception? Yeah. So I am on uh, Instagram at Bryn Turnbull writes. Um, and on Facebook, uh, Bryn Turnbull writes as well. On Twitter, uh, I'm Bryn Turnbull, and my uh, my website is brynturnbull.com, where I actually have uh, I have pages where I kind of go into the back history of this book um, because I do so much research for these books, and I I like to put it down somewhere. <laughs> well, again, we've been speaking to Bryn Turnbull, author of the new novel, The Paris Deception. The novel is available now, so go buy a copy. And Bryn, thanks for doing this interview. Oh, thank you so much, Jeff. It's been a pleasure chatting with you. Absolutely.